let's take out our Bibles and learn together. A few years ago, I met a man who was extremely successful from a worldly perspective. Not only successful, he said he had nearly a perfect life. From the time that he graduated high school until now, and when I met him, he was 79 years old. He had a very good life from a material standpoint. He began a business, and what success did he have? In fact, he was worth several hundred million dollars. I only met him once, and when he talked about his life and how everything went perfectly for him, in fact, he said, I don't understand how I had so much success. But when he talked now at the age of 79 and reflected back upon that life, you know what he said? It all went so quickly. He could not believe that his life was coming to an end. Now think about something. From a material standpoint, from a worldly perspective, everything went pretty much perfectly for him. He had wealth. He had prestige. He had possessions. He had notoriety. But now he knew it was all coming to an end, and he felt sad. Because for him and his belief, it was all going to be over. He had done nothing for eternity. In fact, he didn't believe that there was an eternity. He thought that the end was in sight. How sad it is when people do not realize that our life in this body is but a vapor, so says James. And so many people fail to be prepared for eternity, and I'm speaking about the kingdom. Well, you may not be successful, worldly, speakingly, from that standpoint. You may not be wealthy. You may not have had prestige and great possessions. But if you understand the truth of the kingdom, you are greatly successful. And what's that truth of the kingdom? One word, the gospel. And what we've seen so far in our study of the book of Galatians is how the apostle Paul desires greatly that the reader, those in Galatia, that they would understand the true message of the good news concerning the kingdom, the gospel. Well, let's begin where we left off last week, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 15. Now, here Paul is speaking once again to, to those congregations in Asia Minor. in that region known as Galatia, and he addresses them with hope. That is, he says, brethren. So he's trying to encourage them that, that they still have hope if they begin to understand that truth and respond to it. So he says, brethren, look at verse 15, according to man. Now, what he's saying here is that he wants to give them a illustration from a human perspective that they might know spiritual truth. So he says, brethren, according to man, I speak. Likewise, a man after ratifying a covenant. Now, that word covenant can also be translated testament. In fact, when we speak about the new covenant or the New Testament, we use that word. It's also the same word for what we would call in English a will, like the last will and testament. So he's given an example that a man after ratifying his will. Now, what does that mean? Well, there's something very different. And those in, in that culture would have understood what he's talking about. You see, today, usually a man does not ratify his covenant. That means he doesn't put it into action. What happens is that it goes into action after he passes away with his death. But that's not how it used to be, especially within the Jewish community. A man would, would wait until his youngest son became of age, when he graduated to manhood. And then that father would bestow all of his wealth, all of his possessions, all of his resources upon his children and rely upon them to manage everything in his behalf. And once he ratifies that he certifies that will, he puts it into action. As it says here, look again at verse 15. 
it says that no one is able to set it aside or add to it. So once it's put into force, it cannot be altered in any way. Now, this is something that the people would have understand, and he's using that so that we can understand the truth concerning Abraham's covenant. Let's move on to verse 16. And to Abraham was spoken the promises and to his seed. Now, Abraham received it, and this covenant was pertinent to him and to his seed, Bilvad, that means only to them. For it does not say, and to the seeds, which is many, that is in the plural, but it says, unto one, and that is your seed. And who is that? Notice what it says at the end of verse 16, which is Messiah. So here's the truth. If, if you want to be part of that covenant, and what is that covenant? In one word, a blessing. How do we understand that blessing? In another one word phrase, the kingdom. That's it. If you want to have the blessing of that kingdom, that is eternity with God, then you have to be what? You have to be connected to Messiah. It's only through him, that seed, that we can have that hope, that sure expectation of Abraham's promise, that is a kingdom covenant being established with us. So notice what he says, move on to verse 17. For this I say a covenant, when he says, if it's previously been ratified, that is if it's put into action beforehand by God, what does he say? It says, that which came after, and he's speaking about the law, literally he says, that which came after 430 years, it is not able to, to change anything, that is, it's not able to annul or to cancel out the promise. So here's what he's saying. He's given this example. You can't change a man's will after it's been ratified and put into action in that same way. After God made that covenant with Abraham and put it into force, something that takes place 430 years after what he's referring to, the law of Moses. That law of Moses cannot alter that covenant. It can't bring any change to it. And we're going to see that the nature of that covenant, a word that appears over and over, we see it in verse 14, and we've seen it one other time today. He says it can't alter it because it's based in a promise. A promise from who? The living God. Move on to verse, verse 18. There we see a expression where it says agar. What does that mean? It identifies a hypothetical situation. He says, for if from the law is the inheritance, it's not, but he's saying if by chance, a hypothetical situation, if by the law was the inheritance, then it's no longer based in what? He says a promise. Why? Because when we read the law of Moses, it talks about the expectations that God has for us. Remember what the prophet Jeremiah says about the law. He says, which we broke. So there's a, a, a view concerning the law of doing. We have to do it. If we don't, we break it. But if we were able to do it, another hypothetical situation, if we were able to do it, we would achieve it based upon works. And therefore, it would be a payment rather than what? What the law, or excuse me, what the covenant of Abraham was initially, and that is a promise. So he says, if there was an inheritance by the law, it would no longer be a promise. But to Abraham was the promise, and what does your Bible say? Now, many translations say, was made by God. But that's not what it says. It uses a word, the root of that is the word charis, where we get the English word grace. So what I want you to see is this. Paul is speaking and he's revealing something. The Abraham covenant came into being by God's grace. It was initiated by the grace of God. And that's why it's dependent upon a promise rather than 
our deeds. If it was done by deeds, it wouldn't be based in grace and it wouldn't be established in a promise. Verse 19. So if we've learned, and this is what Paul said in these first few verses, if we've learned that the law cannot affect the covenant of Moses, the covenant, excuse me, if we learn that the law cannot affect the covenant of Abraham because it's a promise rooted in grace, then he says, I have a question for you. What purpose is there to the law? Look at verse 19. That's exactly where Paul goes. Therefore, what is the law? And he answers, on account of transgressions. Whose transgressions? Yours and mine. In other words, it was because of our our sin. And what is that? Well, notice what he says. Once again, therefore, what, meaning what purpose is the law? It was added on account of our transgressions until the seed should come which is a promise which has been arranged by the angels through a mediator. Now, this is an idiom in the Greek language. Whenever angels, when it says by means of angels, what it's talking about, a heavenly perspective. The the covenant of Abraham was, was heavenly in nature. And it was enacted in your life and my life by what? A mediator. And who's that mediator? Well, we're going to see. It is Messiah Yeshua. And here's the important point. Look, if you would, to verse 20. It says, now, a mediator is not one. Now, why would he say that? Well, a mediator does the work for another. And what it says here, normally speaking, a mediator is not one, but he says, but God is one. So what's he trying to reveal reveal here? A very important theological truth. And that is Messiah and God are one. God himself was that mediator. He became flesh in our behalf in order that that covenant a blessing, that is the kingdom promise, might be made a reality in our life. He did everything and he alone is worthy of the praise. So he says, you know, usually a mediator represents another. So there's more than one, but God, he's done it all. God is one. Therefore, the law, now he's giving another situation. Well, if the law doesn't add something, if the covenant of Abraham is not insufficient, It is sufficient to bring about the purposes and the plans of God, his blessing in our life. Then uh, what purpose is the law? Well, if the law doesn't add anything to it, there's another possibility. And this is what many people think today. And that is that the law is at odds with grace. It is not. Some people think, well, you have the gospel or you have Moses' law. Those are the two options, and some people go one way, and they'll fail, and other people go the right way, and they'll be be blessed. But that's not biblical. Why do I say that? Look at verse 21. He says, Therefore is the law against the promise of God. And notice he answers in the strongest way possible. He says, Meginieto, which means, uh, let it never be. It's an idiom, so say some, that means God forbid. Look on, verse 21, he uses that same phrase, agar, which means, here's a hypothetical situation. For if a law could be given, which was able to give life. Now, that's not the case. But he says, hypothetically, if this was the case, if a law could be given, made, that would would bestow life, then by the law would be righteousness or justification. But we know that's not the case. But what has happened? Now he's going to talk about the purpose of the law. Beginning in verse 21, he's talking about the right understanding of a believer of why the law was given. He says, look at verse 22. But in order to, and he's talking about the scripture, in order for the scripture to do something, to close us up together, all of us, under what? Under sin. Now, I want you to pay attention to a very important word. It means under. It's the Greek word hupo. When it's under, like it says here, under sin, it means under the authority of sin. 
To be under something means that we're going to receive the outcome of that. What's the outcome of sin? Death. So what the law does, it announces a, a, a situation that was not brought about because of the law, but the law makes clear to us. And what's that? That we are sinners. Let me say that another way. We are Adam's children. And because Adam sin and death came into the world, we are heading towards death. Adam was cast out of the garden. That is, he had no permanent fellowship with God. So the law announces to us that condition, that we are under sin, that is, we're going to die. So the law closes up everyone in that situation, makes us under the authority of sin. What else does he say? Second half of verse 22. It did that in order that the promise would be by faith, the faith in Messiah Yeshua, who is given to those who believe. What's given? That promise. The, the truth of Messiah Yeshua is manifested through the promise. Now, here's the key. When I understand the Torah, what does the Torah teach me? Well, the Torah reveals a few very important things. First of all, the Torah sets forth, as we've said, the expectations of God, what I should do and what I ought not do. And when I apply that standard to my life, what does it make me? It shows me my sinfulness because many of the things God says do them, I don't do. I don't want to do them. And many of the things God says don't do, I do them and my flesh desires to do them. So I see the problem is with me, not the law. Paul says the law is good, the law is holy. It reflects the righteousness of God. So when I apply the law to my life, what does it reveal? I am a sinner. And what am I in need of? I'm in need of, here it is, God's grace, God's promise, God's grace to bring about a change in me. So the law does that. That is, it makes me aware of my need of God's grace. Now, move on to verse verse 23. He says, but before came faith, we were what? Before came faith, we were under the law. What does that mean? Under the authority of the law. And what does the law say? We're sinners. So we're under the law and we were kept up, that is, we were kept close together in order for the revelation of faith to be manifested. So the law, just as I said, the law shows me my need of some different means. It's not going to be through my deeds, my effort, my insight, my intelligence that I'm going to be justified. So I begin, based upon the motivation of the law, it tells me what I lack. I begin to search out God's grace. And within the words of the law, we find a covenant. See, the covenant of Abraham was revealed by the law. It was spoken to to Abraham. It was ratified. It was put into action. But it's only through the testimony of Scripture that I see that. So the law shows me my need that is, I'm a sinner, my need for grace, and there within that is the manifestation, the revelation of God's covenant with Abraham. So he says, once that came about, look at verse 24, so that we understand the law in this way. He uses the word pedagogos. What's that? Pedagogos, that is a a tutor or a schoolmaster. So once again here, he's talking about how to rightly understand the law of God. And we see here that it's a schoolmaster, it's a tutor. And what does it do? We'll keep reading verse 24. So that the law is our schoolmaster. It's, it's, It's become that. In order what? For Messiah. And what does he mean there? He shows us our need of Messiah in order that out of faith we are made righteous. Then he says, that when faith came, we are no longer under what? The schoolmaster. Now, the schoolmaster brings us, does two things. And the schoolmaster is Torah. Torah teaches me of my, my status before God. I am under sin. I am in need of God's grace. 
I cannot save myself. And it teaches me to look for faith. Why? Because it says that Abraham was made righteous. How? It was accredited to him as righteousness because he believed he acted in faith. So the Torah leads me to that. And now once faith comes and becomes a reality, what does he say? Look at that verse. He says, you are no longer under, that means under the authority of the school master. What does that mean? That we're no longer under Torah. What does that mean? It's judgment. It's authority. Because when we're under the Torah, what does it make us? A sinner. But what happens? Well, I become new creation. What does he mean? Notice how this scripture unfolds. Look now to verse verse 26. Now he says all. Doesn't mean all, everyone. It means every believer. All believers have this as a reality. What is, what is that? Look at verse 26. For all are sons of God if, here's a key, if you have executed faith, exercised faith, it says. For, look at it, verse 26. For by means of faith in Messiah, Yeshua, for as many who are in Messiah, what? Have been baptized. Now, what does baptized speak of? Well, baptized speaks, baptism speaks of two things, death and resurrection. So now I have what? Died through Messiah. When Messiah died upon that tree, I died too. But the scripture says when he rose from the dead, I rose with him. That is, I have new life. So why is it so important that it says baptized here? Because baptism is death. What happens? Death is a consequence of the Torah. So I have already suffered through Messiah's work. He paid the price. He died for me, but I have experienced death. So I'm no longer under the law. Under law's judgment, sinner, what's the outcome of sin? Death. So I'm no longer under this, this law, but rather I have been born again. And that's why he says, look again, verse, verse 20, 27. For as many who are in Christ have been baptized. And it says, also, what have you done? You have put on Christ. That is, you've become alive in Messiah. The life that he lives, you are to live. His life becomes your life. Now, what are we talking about here? One word, the gospel. And if you were to answer with a one-word answer, what is the gospel? You know what the right answer would be? Yeshua. That is Messiah. Because it's when you are in him, he is your life, that you have experienced that gospel message. So move on, verse verse 28. He says one of the most uh, misunderstood passages. Look at verse 28. For there is no longer a Jew or Gentile or a slave or a free or male or female. Now, does that what he means? There's no longer any more males or females? No. What he's talking about here is access to this gospel. What he wants to say is this. It doesn't make a difference if you're Jewish or you're not. If you're a male or a free male. If you're free or a slave, that gospel is available to you. We become one in Messiah. Now, we don't lose our gender. We don't lose our nationality, our ethnicity. We don't lose whatever status. We're still that. But none of those things keep us from experiencing the power of the gospel, that power of salvation. That is, that outcome of Abraham's covenant that we become justified, we are made righteous, and we will have life eternal in that kingdom. So he says here, you know, we are all, verse 28 in, for we all are in Messiah, one in Messiah, Yeshua. And if you are Messiah, then he says, here's the result. Then you are a seed of Abraham. What does that mean? Well, why does he use that phrase? Because earlier on, when he's talking about this, he says this covenant of promise, this covenant of blessing, this covenant of inheritance, that is the kingdom, is made to Abraham and to his seed. And the only way that we can become part of that hope, and it's a sure hope, it's not something that I hope, it's something that God has promised and he has made possible through his grace. He says the only way that we can ensure that we are part of that 
is through becoming a seed of Abraham. And the only way to become a seed of Abraham is by means of faith in the promise of God, that gospel. So he says, but you are of Messiah, therefore a seed of Abraham are you. And it says that you are heirs too. And how did he begin? Talking about promise. What did he say in the middle? That the Abraham's covenant is a promise. And what does he say now? That we are heirs of a promise. So when it comes to having hope, it's all based in in one truth. God has promised. And how does God make that promise a reality? Well, he issued that promise, what the scripture says, with caris, with grace. That means we don't deserve it. We didn't merit. We didn't earn it. But what did we do? We receive it based upon our faith in God as the author of this covenant. God as the one who makes it a reality for you and me if we take hold of Abraham's faith. See, when we look at the scripture over and over, Abraham is a man that is surrounded by two concepts in the scripture. One is promise. He was a man moved by the promises of God. And why was that a reality in his life? Well, here's the second word, faith. He had faith in God's promises. Now, another important thing is this. He did not believe that he, in and of himself, was able to take hold of them. But he relied upon God's grace. That's where his faith was aimed. And God, being sovereign, who has issued forth his grace by who? Well, remember the key of this covenant. One of the most important phrases in the scripture is, which says, you will be blessed in, in who? All the families of the earth will be blessed in Messiah Yeshua, that seed. And that's what this passage shares with us over and over. That it's through the seed of Abraham, Messiah Yeshua, that we can know this promise, not just for a season, but for all of eternity. Well, we'll close with this. Remember this hope that we have of eternity and not just a hope in a fleeing vapor, this body and this life.